Hey everyone, I'm Shannon Keebler with Empower Consulting, and thanks for joining me as we discuss today four different rounding strategies to improve your students' number sense, um, idea of magnitude comparison, and their ability to defend and reason as to why a number might round up to the next decade, 10th, 10, 100, etc., or why it might stay at its current place value position. So join me as we discuss these four strategies, and I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts at the end. Thanks, everyone. The four strategies we'll explore today are number lines, rounding frames, the proof picture, and of course, a rhyme. Rounding with number lines helps students to defend where a number lands in between the current decades, the hundreds, the tens, etc. If we were to take the number like 68, the first thing I'd want kids to do is be able to make a number line of 60 to 70. What you'll see on my screen is that we actually have two different number lines because although we would like for students to draw the first number line that just shows the space between 60 and 70, I find that many students actually have to start by creating the number line below, which counts by tens. We want students to know that we're only talking about numbers between 60 and 70, but many of our students are lacking this magnitude comparison or understanding of how small or large a number is and really what number or where that number falls on a number line. So if you have students that struggle, just having the number line of 60 and 70 isn't going to help them because they don't know that 68 falls between 60 and 70. So many of them need to write out the entire number line to get a general idea of where the number falls. I'll explore both. So the first thing we want kids to do after they make their number line is they, we want them to find the halfway point. Now I'll take my marker as students have their number line and I'll ask them to clap when I get to about halfway. So as I move along this number line, I'm looking to hear when kids are clapping. Do they clap here? Do they clap here? And really I hear claps all along the spectrum, which means we still have students that are trying to figure out what halfway means. So most kids would start to clap right around there and when they clap here we know that we can then ask what is the middle what is the middle number between 60 and 70 and hopefully students then would say well it's 65. so if i have all my markers on this number line whether you draw them in or not um, i then want students to think is 68 going to be greater than halfway to 70 or is it going to be not quite halfway so past halfway before halfway. That's what I want them to think to themselves. So 68, if I go to 65, which in the middle, and I count forward, I would find 68. And so now my students can visually see that 68 is actually closer to 70 than it is to 60. In fact, it's only um, two spaces or two jumps away from 70, whereas if I were to go the other direction, it would be eight spaces back to 60. This is a really good defense. So when I ask students, how do you know where 68 rounds? I don't want them to say, well, because five and above, you give it a shove, which is one of the similar rhymes that many of us teach in our classrooms. The rhyme uh, in general isn't the issue. It's the idea that they have no other way to really defend why 68 would round to 70. They just follow their trick, their rhyme, their rule. In this case, we're giving students a visual model so that they can see really why does 68 round to 70. So as I look at my next number line from my 10 to 90, I would have kids find where 68 falls on my number line. And so if they know, if I said clap when you think I get there, right, I'd come all the way over here, they'd probably clap right around in this area. So now I know that my two end marks are 70 or 60. I want to know the tens that are around where I think 68 falls. I then mark my halfway point so that I can see is 68 past the halfway mark or is it before the halfway mark? So once again, we get students that can say it's after the halfway mark, it is closest to 70. In this case, they don't even need the other tick marks for them to know if it's past halfway, then we know it goes to that next 10. We have to be careful though, because many students struggle with knowing what tens uh, that number could round to. Could it round to 68? Or excuse me, could it round to 60? Or could it round to 70? And many students will say 50. 
And I understand why they would say that, because if we round up, like we say all the time, it goes to 70. So if I'm at 68, rounding down would make sense that it would be at 50, because for 68, we went up to a decade. So why not go down a decade when we say round down? So instead, we want to help them see this visual that we want to know that the what tens or what decades are on both sides of that number. That will help them to see what my choices are. 50 isn't even an option for rounding 68. Next, look, let's look at rounding frames in combination with a proof picture. So a rounding frame is going to have students to keep track of the numbers that we're on, which is 68, and the numbers or the decades that surround that number 68. In this case, we're rounding to the closest 10. So I want the two tens that surround 68. If we've done this number line work, students now can visualize what tens are on either side of the number 68. I then draw visually what the number is. The number is 68, so it's six tens and eight ones. From here, I have students draw the 70, and then I have them draw the 60. We're looking to see how many ones or tens are, does it take to get to 70 versus how many ones or tens does it take to get to 60. In this case, we can see that it takes two more ones to make that new 10. So instead of being at 60, I would now be at 70. So again, it takes two ones to get me to 70 versus it would take me eight ones to get back to 60. This is another visual that supports the number line work, but it starts to morph into a more simplistic proof drawing or over here, just the rounding frame. So students eventually are able to drop the proof drawing. They're able to drop the number line because now they can just visualize where that number is on the number line and which decade numbers surround it. So you can see visually 60 or 70 would be going up on the number line and 60 would be the closest 10 below 68. So taking 68, we would round to 70. Next, let's look at rounding with number lines for 147. So now I have a number in which I want to know what is the closest 100. So my first number line again starts with the 100 that I'm on, which is 100, and the next 100, which is 200. My first step, let's find the halfway point. So now that we know the halfway point, I have to identify it. What's halfway between 100 and 200? The answer is 150. And now I want to know, does 147 come before the halfway point or does it come after? So again, I would have my pointer here or my marker and I would go across my number line and I would ask students to clap when they think we're about 147. This is a really great activity to see where students think numbers fall on the number line. So as they do that, they would surely find that 147 is pretty close to 150 but it's still before the halfway point. Therefore, it is closer to 100 than it is to 200 because it hasn't even made it halfway yet. Now, I can talk about counting back until I get to 100, or I can talk about how many steps it is to go forward to 200 as I'm counting by tens. Either one now is a defense and is a reasonable argument as to why 147 rounds to 100. You can see right below it now that I have another number line in which we would have kids count by tens for, from 100 to 200. This will help many of your students see where really is the halfway point as well as where 147 lies. The first number line is relying on their sense of number to understand that the halfway between one and 200 is 50 and then where exactly 147 lies. Whereas the second number line, many students who may have to start with 100 count by tens and keep going and then identify, okay, well, where would 147 be? And it would have to be in this area. So now I know that my surrounding decade numbers or hundreds, if you will, would be 140 or 150 if I was rounding by tens. But in this case, I'm rounding by hundreds. So if 147 falls right here and I'm rounding to the nearest hundred, now I know the closest hundred is either 100 
or the second closest hundred is 200. So let's go ahead and find that halfway point. And we know that 150 is halfway between 100 and 200. And then 147 falls right before 150. Therefore, we're not even halfway. So 147 would round to 100. Now let's look at the rounding frame. Again, I have 147. I want to round to the nearest 100. I can either round to the 100 I'm on, which was to the left of the number on the number line, or the next number, which is 200. I know that 147 falls between these two hundreds. Where would it round? First, let's start with a proof picture. I could do 147, and then I would draw 200, and then I would draw 100. Well, as you can see, on 147, I would need three additional ones just to make it to my next 10. So now I would have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, but I would need more to get all the way to, um, to 200. 60, 70, 80, 90, 200. So altogether, I would need 53 to get to 200. Well, let's see how much I would need to get all the way down to just my 100 square here. I would need my seven ones and my four tens. So I would need 47 to make it to my 100. Since 47 is less than 53, I know that 100 is closer. So 147 would round to 100. Let's take this idea and go further and talk about decimals. It works the same. If I had one and 37 hundredths and I wanted to round to the nearest tenth, where would I round? So as you can see, the first number line again is where we hope students start to get to once they understand the number line and the place value system. That one and three tenths and one and four tenths, it would be in between here that I would actually find one and 37 hundredths. So you can see my number line down here is actually counting by tenths. We start with one, one and one tenth, one and two tenths, one and three tenths, one and four tenths, and I could actually have a third number line here for students that still weren't seeing where 37 hundredths was. And my number line then would count by hundredths. And it might start with one and 30 hundredths, one and 31 hundredths, one and 32 hundredths, one and 33 hundredths. So it depends on where students are at with their understanding of the decimal system as to which number line may be the most beneficial for them. So let's start with our first number line, one and three tenths or one and four tenths. Remember, the first thing we do is find halfway. And I know that halfway between one and three tenths and one and four tenths is one and 35 hundredths. So where is one and 37 hundredths? It'd be right here. So it's past halfway. It's only three more until one and four tenths, but it's seven more until one and three tenths or seven back to one and three tenths. Again, I might need a hundredths number line for students that are still struggling to see that between one and three tenths and one and four tenths, each one of these marks is a hundredth. 1 and 31 hundredths, 1 and 32 hundredths, 1 and 33 hundredths, etc. If we looked at my number, bottom number line, I would count by tenths and I'd find my halfway point. Once I did 1 and 3 tenths and 1 and 4 tenths, I know 1 and 37 hundredths has to fall in here. I find my halfway point, I mark where 1 and 37 hundredths goes, and now I know it rounds to 1 and 4 tenths. For some kids with decimals, I think their proof picture might help them even more. So if I have one and 37 hundredths, the nearest tenth is either going to be my four tenths or my three tenths. Well, let's look at it with a proof drawing. Here I have one and 37 hundredths. I like to use it with money as I think students understand that a bit better than just calling them tenths and hundredths. They are money, dimes and pennies. But then if I were to actually show them with dimes and pennies, it would look like this. $1.37 looks like $1, three dimes, and seven pennies. So I'm trying to ask myself, what would one and four tenths look like? Well, that's our one and three tenths, $1 and three dimes. One and four tenths, 
$1 and four dimes. So now you can visualize that I have seven hundredths. Seven hundredths, how close is it to making another dime? Well, it's only three more to make it to my next dime, which would be four tenths, or it's seven pennies away from being back to one and three tenths. So again, we can see it is closer to one and four tenths. So if we look at these strategies again, really I gave you just those three. I gave you number lines. We did rounding frames, but we combined it with the proof picture. And then of course there's the rhyme. Five and above, give it a shove. Four and below, lay it low. The rhyme isn't inherently wrong. It's only when we teach the rhyme before we teach students to understand numbers. If we're complaining about students' lack of number sense, this is one of the ways that we can prepare students to bridge that gap between that gap of number sense and their gap of understanding. Therefore, let's teach number lines, rounding frames, and proof pictures so that students are defending, reasoning, and modeling, and then we can give them the rhyme as our shortcut. Thanks for joining my video. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And of course, follow me online at www.empowerlearngrow.com. And you can meet up with me on all the social media platforms listed below. Thanks and happy rounding.